want to go ahead and get started then with our discussion for today. Uh, we're going to talk about grants and the grants process. And if you don't know me, I'm Laura Myers. I'm the Executive Director and Senior Research Scientist here at CAPS. And I have been in the grants process probably for about 30 years, writing grants, getting grants, going through the whole process. And so I can give you a little bit of that perspective, but what I want to talk about today is how we do it here at CAPS, how we get our grants, how that process works, how it applies to what you do. There's also a lot of people here in the room that are grants people. They have worked in the grants process for quite some time. And so their perspectives are going to be very relevant to the discussion. So I want you guys to feel free to add in, provide examples, make comments as I talk about the various issues here. So let's first of all start with the title. This is not my title. This is Valerie's title. It was actually mine. Was it? Oh, now I know. <laughs> I ripped it off from NPR. So. Did you? Okay. Well, I think it's interesting. Yeah. How I learned to stop worrying and love the grant process. You will never, ever love the grant process. <laughs> That's the whole point about grants. The grant process is complicated and can be difficult. And so really the way to get good at it, not love it, but get good at it is really through experience. It's an experience process of going through the process of locating grants, securing grants, actually doing the grant projects, getting them to finalization, and then turning that around again for subsequent grants. And so that's how people get good. And they get good at it for various reasons, and I'm going to talk a lot about that today in terms of how we get the grants and which grants are more probable than others. There's a whole lot of factors that go into that grant process and doing what we need to do to get our grants. So let's talk about that. First of all, as a grant-funded institution, how we get and manage these grants directly affects all of us here at CAPS. We are a total soft money operation. Everything we do is based on the grants and contracts that we get. Most researchers work grant to grant, but a center like CAPS works on multiple grants at the same time, and a lot of overlapping grants in terms of time frames. So we're a little bit more unique than the average researcher who may be carrying one or two grants at a time. So I'm going to talk about that complexity as well. Now, I'm going to talk to you about the grant process, how we find the grants, how we acquire the funding, and how we spend the funding. All of you guys are involved in that process to some degree or another at some point. And that's the reason for this discussion today, is to really tie together everything that you do with this whole grants process so that you know where you're at in that process. I want to talk a little bit about grants versus contracts, because we do both. We have a lot of grants and we have a lot of contracts. Grants are competitive. Grants are things where a certain select group of entities can apply. They all compete during a process and certain ones are chosen. One or more than one may be chosen to receive that grant. A contract is different. It's when a funding agency says, you're the one we want to do the job and we're going to contract with you to do that job. Remember I talked about success and you know, being a good grantsman? Contracts are better than grants in that sense because it's not competitive. You don't have to do all that work, submit it through that process, and wait to see if you win the grant. Okay? And I'm going to talk a little bit about those probabilities and that grant process and how we try to reduce those uh, or increase our probabilities of getting the grants. So let's talk about the types of grants for a minute. There are grants where we actually create something, we develop something and implement those things. Many of the grants that you work on are those types of grants. An agency or an entity wants a particular product for a purpose and they want to apply it to a large population, a large entity. So for example, the e-citation grants. The e-cite system is used for law enforcement agencies in a large jurisdiction, typically a state. And so we get the grant to produce that product, customize that product, and implement it in a particular state. So that's one type of grant. Another type of grant is the research grant, where we're going to do research on what we do. And it could be research on a product that we're developing, 
or it could be about the populations that we work with, some kind of research question that we're trying to address. So for example, since we work a lot in law enforcement, it might be a research issue associated with law enforcement. So go beyond the e-citation system and implementing e-cite in law enforcement and look at what the information is on the, the citation tickets and researching that information in terms of where do they write tickets, where are their crashes, all of that kind of stuff. So we would do a research grant and answer questions about maybe how eSight improves things. Uh, one of the things in eSight is the DUI ticketing. Does DUI ticketing actually reduce DUIs? Does that make it better? And a lot of the states are interested in those kind of research questions. Now when we do a research grant, the research grants are more likely to be the competitive ones. Now, if it's one of those where we're implementing a product, it may not be as competitive if it's just a straight research grant. So DOJ, BJS, a lot of these federal agencies, they put out these RFPs for research and people pose their own questions that they want to answer in their research and it's very broad, general, and vague. Those are the ones that are really hard to get. When I was in graduate school, I had a professor tell me, that when you compete for research grants, you have a 2% chance of success. Think about that for a minute. 2% chance of success. That's what you're up against. A 2% chance of success. So how do you improve those odds? How do you bring that up? And that 2% prevails to this day. Now, one of the ways that we do this, the way we deal with our grants and our contracts, is we have a team of people who works on these grants. One of the real difficulties for researchers is usually it's one individual writing the grant proposals, trying to secure them for themselves, and that's a lot of work. When you hear about what goes into it today, you're going to realize that for one individual to do it, it's really difficult. And that's what makes that 2% a reality, because if you're out there doing it all by yourself and you don't have support, and you don't have a lot to back you up, it's not going to be the best proposal. You're going to need help. So one of the reasons CAPS is so successful is we do it as a team. I was so happy when I got here that I didn't have to write grants by myself anymore. Because we have a lot of people here who do it. And I've got a picture here of the grants guru for CAPS. This is Dr. Dave Brown. He spends a lot of time writing grant proposals. In fact, you can say, Dave, here's an idea. And tomorrow you're going to have a proposal ready to look at. I mean, he can sit down and he knows all the component parts, he knows everything that needs to be done, which is what increases our success because we have somebody so experienced in what is required and what is already successful. And so we take those same success strategies and put them into every proposal. So he works primarily on the proposal writing process, then there's a group of about five or six others that write on the proposals, and you in fact may have been asked to contribute components to proposals over time, because if it was something that involved something you do, you may have been asked to write subparts for those proposals. And that really makes it a lot easier to get this done. One of the big problems with grant proposals is a short timeline to write the proposal. Typically it'll come out and it'll be due in three, four, five weeks. And it's like, how am I going to get all that together? Well, we have a lot of boilerplates and templates already ready to go. And then we put those teams together and we get those things churned out. And that's again why you need that team and that support to do that. Now, here's a diagram of the grant writing process. And it's cyclical in the sense that you're going to go through all of this if you're successful at each stage. But the cycle never stops because even after you complete your grant, you're going for the next grant, either while you're still working on the first one or right after you finish. You really don't want to wait till you finish because you need that funding coming in right behind it. So you may have to start this process way back somewhere in the early cycle. So it starts with the research and writing process. What are we going to do? We get a bunch of people together and we brainstorm what it is we're going to do. What are we going to propose? And then we start the writing process. We start with an initial approach. When we start that proposal, where we end up may not be where we start. We start writing it, we start putting it together, and so then we keep getting all the brains together on it going, maybe we need to do this or maybe we need to do that. So it's this ongoing, evolving process you follow up on that, you get it all finalized to a full, pro pro full proposal that gets submitted. Hopefully, you receive that grant. You get the grant, you do it, 
and then you report at the end of it what you did, the success of it, and you're done with that process. Seems fairly straightforward and simple. It's not very straightforward and simple. It does follow a lot of structure, and we'll talk about that as we go through this process. So let's talk about how we find the grants. How do we know what to go after? Well, there's a lot of ways to search for grants, and a lot of the grants come to us. As you know, we work with a lot of the state agencies here in Alabama, and they find out about a lot of grants that would benefit the state. And so we work with them to develop proposals, and we work as subcontractors to them, and they submit the grants. And they have a much higher success rate because a lot of the grants that they find are grants that are designated for particular states. So if we're looking at NHTSA or FMCSA or any of those entities, Alabama, Mississippi, several of the states that we are involved with, they're very far down the list on those issues that those entities are concerned with. So high crash rates, lots of commercial vehicle problems, all of those things. So grants get designated. You know, if we lived in a, you know, a different state where they didn't have these problems, then we wouldn't be as lucky to get those grants. So we're in the opportunity to be able to get these grants and help these states work through those issues. So a lot of our grants are those types of grants. The other ones we have to look for. And so there's a lot of ways to do that. The federal government provides a source called grants.gov. If you haven't been to grants.gov, go take a look at it. The university also has a system called Pivot so that you can actually set up a system to provide you every week um, grant RFPs based on parameters that you preset. So whatever you're interested in, whatever you work on, you can actually have it drive RFP information to you on a regular basis. So you can go out looking for it, you can have it driven back to you. There also may be funding sources that we get grants from a lot, and so we have them send their RFP information to us. And they send those to us in a, on a seasonal basis. There's a season for writing grants. As you know, most grants start October 1st. So the cycle has to be way back in the year. So we go through this flurry back in the spring of writing all these grant proposals. Then it goes through the summer process, and then there's announcements over the summer. And then we start the new grants on October 1st. So we don't write them as, you know, um, as many at any one particular time. Sometimes it's very seasonal, and we kind of go through those loops in that process. Now, I mentioned the grant probabilities. A lot of our grants are those high probability ones. And a lot of them are grants we've already had previously. So this is the next round and the next round and the next round. When I was at Mississippi State, we had one of the eSight grants for Mississippi, and CAPS was a subcontractor. So every year we had to reapply for the next eSight grant, and that's been going on five, six, seven years now. Same thing with Alabama, and Rhonda works with ADECA. Those, the ADECA is the one that does the eSight grants for Alabama, and that's just a continual process of reapplying every year and getting the resources to do the next stage of what we're doing for each of those states. Now, how do we increase our probabilities? It's about relationships. It's about knowing these funding sources. It's about knowing the program managers. It's about knowing the entities that want these things done. So you're probably aware um, from the projects that you work on that we have these contacts and these funding agencies and the state agencies that we work with. And you may have actually communicated with some of them yourself. And so we're constantly in communication with them about what they need, what they want, and what type of funding is coming up. So we cultivate those relationships to make sure we're in the right place at the right time to provide those services. We also provide very good services. So a lot of times they come right back to us because of our track record. And so that increases our probabilities. So good work begets the next opportunity. So we're always constantly working that process to enhance the number of proposals and the number of wins that we can get in the process. So let's talk about the proposal process. It typically starts with an RFP, a request for a proposal. It's all the guidelines, what they want, how they want it. They can come in many different forms, a very sophisticated official RFP. It could even just be something called an RFI, a request for information. They kind of want to know what you might be able to do, and if they like what you're able to do, then they'll do the RFP. It may be very general and vague. It may even be verbal. 
We may even get somebody that contacts us and says, this is what we want, this is how we'd like it, and we don't see anything in writing, and then we have to write the proposal from that. And that can be pretty complex. Regardless, there's going to be rules about what we include in the proposal. So the very official RFP provides a lot of rules. If you've ever seen a federal RFP, it's pages upon pages upon pages of stuff, most of which takes an experienced grantsman to be able to decipher, because once you've deciphered it once, right, Jeff? <laughs> it's all the same kind of stuff. And so you have to include a bunch of things on almost every proposal for the feds. And so a lot of those rules are in there, and we have to make sure that they're there. We also have to check the deadlines. They may want a letter of intent before they want the proposal, and there's a deadline for the letter of intent. The letter of intent says, this is what we want to do, and we intend to do a proposal. We've got to submit by a certain date. Then we've got to have the grant proposal there by the deadline that they set. And it's usually 5 o'clock Eastern time on some crazy day, two or three weeks from now. And it may have to be there electronically. It may have to have multiple copies. If you don't read the rules, we've had some situations here on Friday evening uh, where we were looking at a rule that we didn't realize was there, going, how are we going to get it there by Monday at whatever time it needed to be there and all the number of copies. So it can get really time consuming. I worked on one at a university one time where we worked and worked and worked, and then the dean got on an airplane and hand carried it to Washington, D.C. to make the deadline. So that's why these deadlines are really critical. You've got to know what they are. And when we do it here, that's the first thing we look at. If we're going to pursue a proposal, we say, what are the deadlines? And we work back from those deadlines. So then there is the proposal itself. And you've got to break it into its component parts. It's a process. You just don't sit down and write a grant. Well, maybe Dr. Brown does. But <laughs> it really is a process of putting these component parts together. And it takes those grant writers to do that. Now, I saw this cartoon and I thought this was interesting. This is a group of people who are apparently going to review grant proposals to see who wins. And it says, agreed, we fund only those proposals we can understand. Sounds simple, right? A lot of proposals are not very understandable. I'm a reviewer for proposals, too, and a lot of us do that kind of work. And you'd be amazed at people who can't make it clear what it is they're trying to do. So that's the key here, is to make it as understandable as possible. And the RFP makes that easy. It tells you exactly how they want it, how they want it broken down. So it typically starts with the problem statement. What is the issue? All right. And what they're looking for, and they'll even give you your success metrics. They'll say, this is what we're looking for. This is how we're going to evaluate each part of this. So in the problem statement, they're going to look and see, do you really get it? Do you understand it? And that may mean that you have to gather statistics and data to demonstrate the nature of the problem. You may have to give stats for the state that you're operating in and what you're trying to solve for that particular state. And you've got to build that and you've got to build it concisely, and it's not going to take up very much room in this proposal because there's going to be a page limit to this whole proposal. And so you've got to stay within those bounds. Then you're going to provide a scope of work and or a research design. Most of ours are scope of work. Sometimes they're research designs, and sometimes they're both. Scope of work is, here's the problem, here's the solution, here's how we're going to do the work to achieve the solution and they want detail on that. It's like a recipe. When I teach people how to do this, I say it's a recipe. Because what has to happen is, as in all research, it has to be replicatable. And so what they're looking for is, how are you going to go about doing it? So if you don't explain it in detail, they don't know. And they'll dock you for that. Now that research design is if it involves a research component. And more and more of our grants include a research component now, if nothing else but an evaluation component. And I'll tell you what that is in just a second. But whatever research is involved, we have to put a design methodology in there. How are we going to conduct the research? And again, that's another recipe. And they want to know that you know what you're doing. They want to see a management plan. One of the things they're going to be concerned about is can you really do it? They don't know everybody that's applying for these things. They don't know if you have the capacity to do this. They don't know if you have the right people to do it. So from uh, every once in a while, you may hear us trying to get all of our resumes and vitas up to date. We have to keep those things current 
to supply in the proposal to show that we have people who have those capabilities. So if we're saying we're going to build this product and it's going to take certain skills, we've got to show we've got people that have those skills and that experience. So we have to show that management plan. Who's going to be involved, why are they going to be involved, and how are they going to work? There's also typically a literature review. And that's going to vary on different types of grants that we do. Some of ours are real general and they don't require a lot of literature support and they're much shorter proposals than a full-blown research proposal. If you're doing a full-blown research proposal, it's almost like a thesis or a dissertation. Anybody working on theses or dissertations or have done such things? Ever written a term paper? Okay, you know about the literature reviews. Same thing goes into these proposals to whatever degree that they require. And if you don't hit the right literature, they'll come back on the review of the proposal and say, you didn't cite the proper literature. Okay, so you got to be good at that. Then you got to talk about the potential impact of what you are proposing. You got to show that you know what this is going to do. So you're going to talk about that impact. I mentioned the capabilities and competencies. We just recently lost an engineering grant with um, NSF for a rapid response facility. And the reason we lost it was not because the capabilities and competence, competencies of the individuals involved, but it was a concern over whether the university had the capability. And you're like, wait a minute, what does that mean? Shouldn't all universities have the capability? Well, some universities have more research capability than others. We are not a research institution, all right? So when we go up against a Stanford or a Georgia Tech or institutions like that, they're going to get higher weight. They're going to be assumed that they have the higher capability. I used to work for a university that had no research capability whatsoever. They didn't know what research was. And I got a grant, and they didn't know how to manage that grant. And so I fought the whole time I was there trying to teach them how to manage this grant. And finally, my funding source came to me and said, you're going to have to go to another university. We're not going to send any more money to that university. And I left that university and went to Mississippi State, which had more capability to be able to do that. I had to pick up my whole family and move them to another state to find a capable institution. So that's a big piece of this. So you can imagine when we propose and we're talking about our capabilities at CAPS, that's very strong. You can imagine with the number of people and the skills that we have and the experience we have, plus our prior history, how important that is in the process. Okay, then there's the evaluation and or a cost-benefit analysis. The feds have gotten in a lot of trouble for spending a lot of money on grants and not getting anything out of it. So now they are requiring every grant to have some kind of an evaluation component in it. You've got to demonstrate that you did it, you got to demonstrate how it's operating, how it's working, whatever the success is. It may even include a cost-benefit analysis. And so you may have seen us bring CBER into some of our lunch and learns to talk about economics. That's where the cost-benefit comes in. What are the economic impacts of what you're doing? And then finally, there's the institutional review that goes along with all proposals. The feds require it. They may require it on the front end or the back end. I prefer the back end because to get institutional review approval on a proposal is very, very time consuming and complex and usually doesn't fit that short timeline. Most of the time they'll let you wait till you get the grant and then you get the institutional review approval. Anybody know what institutional review approval is? How many of you know what that is? All right, let me give you a little brief overview of that. Every university who gets federal funding and runs grants is required to have an institutional review compliance entity, which means they check every bit of research, every proposal about whether or not it's in compliance with the protection of human subjects. Now, it could be animal subjects. If we're doing medical research and testing animals, it could be about that. But what we do is about human subjects. And so you have to go through this protocol to demonstrate that you're going to protect human subjects. You're going to protect their confidentiality. You're not going to do any damage to them. And we have to go through that process for every one of our proposals, regardless. So that's part of this. Now, a really big part of this is the budget. We got to have enough money to do what it is we're doing. And you got to spec that budget right. Because if you spec that budget too high, you're not going to get the grant. They're going to go, what are you asking for? 
If you spec it too low, they're going to go, you don't know what you're talking about either. Or you could spec it a little bit too low, they don't catch it, then we go to do the grant when we get it and we don't have enough money to do it and we start to run into problems. And so you got to be really careful that we do it right. So I want to spend a little bit of time on the budget and the budget justification process and what goes into it. And this is for you guys to understand where you fall in this process because when we do the budget, we're thinking about the teams that are going to be working on these projects. Who's going to work on it, how much it's going to cost us, how much time it's going to take. So we start out with the personnel. Who, why, and how much. We've got to list your names typically. Sometimes we don't. It depends on the funding agency. But a lot of times we have to specifically say, or if it's a developer, we can say developer, whatever it is we need to put on there. And we're going to say why you're on there and for how much and for how long. They want to know those specifics. Then we have to add the fringe benefits. This is one of the hardest pieces to remember. You have a bunch of fringe benefits that goes on your salary. University doesn't pay that. The grant pays that. So we have to include that in the budget. So that has to be calculated based on that first piece. Who, what, and how much. How much, how much fringe is calculated on that percentage to do that. Then we have to see how much equipment we think we're going to need. And some grants allow equipment, some don't. So if it allows it, we need it, we ask for it. Now you've got to be careful if it allows it, but you don't need it, and you ask for it, they'll kill you on it. They won't give you the grant. So don't go asking for something that you're not going to be able to use. Any supplies, tuition for graduate students, travel is a big piece of this. If there's any travel involved, you want to put it on the grant budget. Now, we have overhead here, and I'm going to explain where our overhead comes from, that covers our travel when needed. But it really needs to come off the grant if there's travel directly involved with the grant. So you add that in. And to justify it, you can't just say, I need $10,000 in travel. No. How many trips? Where are you going? How much are the hotels? How many cars? How much mileage? Rental cars? Food? It's complex. And isn't it nice to have a team that can help you do that part of the process? We also have templates for that. Then there's the indirect. The indirect is a percentage that the university applies. So we get this whole budget done, and then we have to add a percentage that the university is going to get. So we have to percentage it, and there's the full amount, which is 49%. That's the on-campus rate, or the off-campus rate, which is 26%. Now, the off-campus rate is if you're going to do this project somewhere totally other than the university. The reason that they take the indirect is because of the overhead they have in terms of providing us a building, our computers, our desks, the air conditioning, uh, the parking place that we park in. It's all of that. They have to have that overhead to be able to run. So they're taking that money, and they don't like to do that off-campus rate because they really can't conceive of a situation where we would be completely off campus. You're going to be in your office doing some of this work. So we don't do too, too much off campus anymore. Most of ours are going to be at that 49%. And that's a new rate. It was 47% up until October 1st coming up. So all new proposals will have this 49%. Now, that indirect does come back to us in a way. When the university takes that percentage, they take a piece of it and give it back to the college, College of Engineering. A piece of it goes to the department, computer science, and a piece of it comes back to CAPS. So we have an overhead account that our piece goes into, and that's what covers our overhead in regards to the travel that's not covered by grants, the equipment that we buy in addition to what we have from um, the grants themselves, as well as the food and the things we do. The food, the meal that you just had here was paid for by our overhead that came from our indirect. And so that's how that cycle works. So we need that indirect, that overhead, to keep coming back to fill those coffers to make sure we have those operating costs. Now, another thing that can be on the budget is a cost share or match. The RFP may require a cost share or a match. We may have to provide it. The entity we're working with may have to provide that cost share. It could be an in-kind match. We may be giving up something for free from the university or from the agency to match what they're providing. So that's a part of the process. If you ever see that in an RFP, we've got to make sure we understand that and we've got to figure out how we're going to do the cost share and or the match. Now, here's an example of what a budget can look like. And when we do our budgets in here, the way the 
leads on the proposals will do this is they'll spec it out and say this is what I need in each of these categories and we provide that information to Jason then Jason does all the calculations because it's not an easy thing to do he knows all the rules for all of these calculations he's going to do all those calculations give it back to us and I can tell you what happens is I'll go in thinking okay I think I kind of know where this is going to end up money wise he'll do the calculation and it'll either be much higher or much lower than I thought it was so then I have to go back and move it around and I got to change everything and keep moving it around to get it to the right numbers because I don't want to be too high or too low and so I got to figure out where I need to be especially if there's a cap so for example uh, one of these that we were doing recently was a two hundred fifty thousand dollar cap I got to stay below two hundred and fifty so Jason helps us with that process to make sure it's all right so you got to list everybody out you got to give their percentage and basically we do it either in FTEs or percentage of a time cycle they're both the same thing and so you'll see either the FTE or the percentage for the 12 month process and typically they're one year if they're more than one year we do it for each of the years that are involved and then the actual amount the fringe is computed off of that for all the same people and then we get a total for the salaries and the fringe benefits that's usually a pretty hefty part of all of our proposals then there's the travel budget. Remember I told you you got to provide a justification behind that. That's why it's $13,589. I should have probably included the cents on that. Because <laughs> that's how detailed they want it. Because they want to make sure you're not boondoggling that money. They want to make sure that you're estimating a certain number of trips for purposes and how much it should actually cost. Supplies, you have to list those supplies out. The tuition. You may have experts contractors on the project so you have to list those out and how much then the total direct cost the indirect computation for your total the total on this was two hundred forty three thousand three hundred and twenty dollars okay so once we get all that together and everything's ready to go and we're happy with it then we have to go through a submission process everything needs to go through the office of sponsored programs here because they're going to check it all again and they do the submission in most cases. We don't necessarily have to do the submission. They do it for us. That's a support function. So they'll work with us along this process. They'll check all of our numbers. And then they'll submit it for us by whatever the deadline is. And it's typically an electronic submission. And they've got those systems all set up over there. And so they do that. They work with us. They make sure all the questions are answered before it goes. And then they let us know that it's been submitted. So that's a UA submission. It may be that we're not the submitters. We may be subcontractors. So it may be that Aaliyah is submitting. And so as a subcontractor, we still have to go through OSP to make sure our subcontract piece is the way the university wants it. Then it goes to Aaliyah, and then Aaliyah submits in the same time frame that OSP would for UA. Now, we go through all that, and then it's time to wait. And so we sit here and speculate about which ones will hit and are we going to hear anything and have we heard anything and it's a great process and when we start getting really worried then all of a sudden we start hearing we've got some and it's like Christmas Day every day for several weeks. Several weeks ago we went through that process. We got this one, we got that one, we got this one. Well then that starts a whole new process because once we get them then we have to get all the accounts set up. So the funding agency and the university have to communicate to get the accounts set up, how the money is going to be done, how it's going to be invoiced, and we can't start work until all that's done. So that all has to be done, and that involves Jason and his team, and they do a lot of work to get all of that set up. And there's a lot of things that have been going on all along the way to try to streamline that process. So we've got all these systems in place to start gathering all the information we're going to need so that we're all ready to go and get that done. So that gets done. Then it's time to start the project. The principal investigators, the project managers, the staff, now it's time to jump in and get this thing going. There will be a kickoff of some type, either a meeting, a gathering, a collaboration about how we're going to start this project off. And it may be prior to the start date or right after the start date to get everything in line. You're going to look at the timelines. In that proposal was a timeline of what you were going to do monthly, quarterly, over the timeline of the project. So you're going to look at those timelines. You're going to look at the deliverables and the milestones. So what should you have at, at the end of each quarter? What should be done? 
and what are you going to do about it if you're not at those milestones. So that's the whole process in the beginning and what you'll be working with as you go through the process. Now, what you need to understand is how you connect to this in terms of spending that grant. Your salaries are coming off of there. Everything that you need to do comes off of those funds. So we're in a process from day one of spending down that grant. So all of that's starting to come out on a regular basis and we're watching that and seeing what happens. And things can happen. We can have changes in personnel. We may need to hire more people, so we may be adding people. We may lose people on a project and have to replace them on the project. Move people around from one grant to another. You guys work on a lot of different projects, so you know that you may actually be charged to one or more of these particular grants. Another thing that can happen is something called scope creep. Remember when I talked about that SOW? I saw the grins across the room. Everybody knows <laughs> about the experience of scope creep. You've got to be very specific about what you're going to do. And at that kickoff meeting with everybody involved, this is what we're going to do. I was at a kickoff meeting one time where the scope creep started on the day of the kickoff at the kickoff meeting. Because some people cannot take no for an answer when you say, no, this is what we said we were going to do, this is what we were funded to do. So it's a constant thing we have to contend with, especially with the people that we work with in our projects. So we have to manage that from day one. One of the things you want to be really careful of is not saying no soon enough, or not saying it strongly enough, or making sure they've been heard. Okay? So we got to make sure we take care of that early on in the process. We don't want to get down to near the end of the grant and the entity says, I'm not getting what you promised. And we say, well, we didn't promise it. Well, yes, you did. And so there we are. Okay? So we want to be real careful with that. And that gets to sponsor issues. Sometimes the sponsor may, may not be happy. They may want something different. So we have to address those when they happen, how they happen. And that's why we have our regular meetings with the sponsor, with our end users, to make sure they're happy with what's going on. Daryl? Find out his sponsor has not deal what they want until these guys start working on it. Yeah. So there is no scope at first. Yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I've, I've heard their prizes with that and experienced it personally. So it is kind of unique, I guess. Or is that unique? Is Caps unique in that respect? Well, I think it's unique to the type of work that we do, and I think it also combines with the type of grant that it is. And so if it's a type of grant where you have to be very clear up front, then you can kind of put those parameters on. But because it's computer science, because it's technology, a lot of times it goes that way, and it may have been generally scoped in the front end because of that. So what you have to do in that case is, as soon as that kickoff happens, you've got to get something out in front of them and get their feedback immediately. So you've got to make sure that you're getting that and you get it secured and then you get all the relevant parties together and say, okay, now, let's make sure we're all in agreement with what this is. And that's where those regular meetings come in. So you've got to make sure you're doing it often, you're doing it regularly, and you're getting everybody to agree. And then you've got to make sure you get it in writing, get it tracked. So I use email for that purpose. So whenever we're trying to get that scope hammered down and we're going through those negotiations, no matter if we have in-person meetings or telephone meetings, I follow up with an email. This is what we agreed to. Is everybody in agreement? And they can either reply to that and affirm it, or they can reply to that and say no, and then we have to renegotiate. If they don't reply at all, my email stands. Okay? And so that email trail is very important. And I can't tell you how many times we've had to go back to those email trails to make sure that we had it. In grants, do they typically, if they want to change uh, for more scope, can you do another grant for additional funding? Well, it depends on the type of grant and, and what we're dealing with. It may be something we've built in. Our PIs are really good about building in a little bit of wiggle room for that, given the nature of what we do. So there'll be some room in there to do that. And so if they're asking for more than what we've built into it, then we'll talk about that. We'll say this needs to go under another grant or another contract. So like with eSight, we know there's going to be another year of funding. So we'll say that's bigger than what we've scoped here. Let's put that on the list for the next grant proposal. And typically most of the states have been good with that. If they haven't been good with that, then they've been like, well, we want it. We'll get a contract. 
So we've been running e-site grants with contracts from the state at the same time to be able to do some of those things that they discovered they wanted all of a sudden. So there's a lot of different ways to do that. So when you run into that, let us know and we can give you some of those creative solutions or you may have a creative solution yourself to work through that. Okay. All right. One thing that can happen is with all the best laid plans, you may not be able to finish it in the time frame. And there's all kinds of reasons for that. Uh, we may run up against barriers such as can't get certain data, something's not working the way it's supposed to, we have to get even more creative. All of us have faced those things. So we're looming towards the end of the project. There's something called a no-cost extension. And most of the funding agencies are good with no-cost extensions because they want it done. And as long as you've been up front about the barriers and issues that you've been dealing with, they're usually agreeable to the no-cost extension. The problem with the no-cost extension in our operation is now we're operating and not being paid because we've probably spent it all down. Think what a no-cost extension means. We're finishing the project with no additional funds. So the goal is to get it done and not have that problem because then we have to switch over and pay for it another way and we don't want to do that. I mentioned the renewals, the multi-year grants. There's all these different things that are going on at the same time. Now, I conclude with my depiction of this process. It's tough. Grant writing's intensive. We spend a lot of time on it. The hours that we spend on grant writing are unbelievable. When we're in season and writing those things on a regular basis, we're pretty much going seven days a week, probably 12 hours a day, day and night, trying to get those things written out and getting them done right and getting them submitted on time. Uh, Dave Brown is a taskmaster on that, making sure we meet those deadlines. He's always reminding us when, where, and how so that we get those things out there and get them done right. So that's the process, that's how we do it, and that's how it applies to what you guys do. So with that, questions and comments? I got a question, um, more of a legal question. What's, the, what's our code ownership legal? Status. When we build something for Alabama, what can we do for Mississippi? Where is it in the grant that it says what we can do? And when do we negotiate that? And can you just talk about our, our difficulties? In yeah, typically it really depends. The universities are really good, and when the grants are done like that, there's an overriding part of the contract with the grant that gets done that's already, that's already built in in terms of the university and who has ownership of the code and all of that, unless it's built into the grant on the front end. And so if that's part of the negotiation on the grant, then that has to be written into it at the time. So if the agency's going to keep the code, if they're going to require it's their code, then they have to put that in up front. Otherwise, we already have it in legal writing. So when I talked about the OSP process, when that grant comes in, there's a bunch of legal documentation that already covers that. So we may get down to the end of the grant and there may be some dispute over who owns that code or who owns whatever part of what we're looking at. And so all we do is go back to that documentation. Plus we have the lawyers to actually look at it and interpret at the time. So if you ever have that question on the front end, we can show you what it looks like. We can have the lawyer come over and talk about what that is. And we can also look at it on a grant by grant basis if you think it's going to be an issue or it's going to be a problem. I'm, I'm, my question is more of a, yeah, that, that, that's definitely uh, answered my question, but a follow up question is how do we plan for reusability between all these things when? And that's what I'm talking about. It's already built in because the university is fully aware of what we do. So they understand, like with the eSight technology and that code, they understand that we're going to be using it in different places. And again, remember, the funding agency is contracting with us to build that. We're not getting anything out of it. It's really the application of that code to these agencies. And so in a case like that, it's not a for-profit situation for the funding agency because they want that distributed as much as possible. So if we say, we're developing it for Alabama, but now we'd like to use it for Mississippi, they're not going to have a problem with that. And that's what the lawyers look at. That's what the funding agencies look at. When you start to get into a for-profit situation, that's where it gets hinky and, and that's where everybody's got to look at it. And there's still that part of it. There's the whole commercialization side of it. Universities do that. We're just starting to get into that whole commercialization and what we can do with our code and who would own it and how that would work. So, uh, or I'll, I'll throw something in on, so what we're trying to do, as she said, as we've 
just kind of start thinking more along the lines of commercialization or just to take it to another state or agency, whatever. So <clears throat> to address that, what we've started doing is, is when they'll agree to it, is issue them a license, um, you know, they use the word in perpetuity. Uh, so they have the right to use that at their heart's desire, but they can only use it for their self. And we retain the right to the license to take it anywhere else we want. Um, yeah, so so that going forward, that's how we're trying to address the IP. Yeah, I mean you that know, came up recently, and Lauren specifically said in every contract, every blanket agreement she puts out there, she puts that we own the IP. Right. So unless they push back, it's going to say we own. Right. Yeah, and then even when they do push back, we'll at least share in ownership. So we, you know, the university constantly wants to share their their rights to the IP in case somebody makes money. Um, and if we end up doing research on it, um, in a sense, we legally can't. You know, we didn't have to ask them or whatever. So, but that that's, I guess, a little more specific answer to, to your question. I have a completely separate question and um, backing up to the budgeting that we did. Um, it's been very clear to me over the years here that the hours that I work and the effort that I do never matches my effort certification or the budget. Can you talk about our legal compliance issues with that? And yeah. Um, Basically, when you talk about legal compliance, what the, the feds are concerned with and what the university has to be in compliance with is 100% load. So everybody has 100% load and you can't go over that 100% load and you're supposed to be working directly to those percentages. But, and this is where your concern comes in, is we run a lot of grants and we move people around a lot and we have a lot of overlapping deadlines. The feds and the university allows for a movement in that. Is it, is it six months that they allow for the movement right in that? Now, yeah, it's been six weeks to 12 months, but right now we're certifying six months later. Right. So they allow the flexibility in that process. So what they're going to look at is, is, is it as close as possible to that process. So in a given year, all of us are switching on and off and working on different things. And remember I talked about all those different dynamics of things that can happen. You can be working on a no-cost extension but still be working on that particular project but it's coming off of a different fund. You may be actually working on a product that transcends multiple grants. And so you may have different percentages coming off of multiple grants because you're working on a product that goes to those multiple grants. And those percentages change every month because that's spend down the way it works is it's going to be looked at every month in terms of how it's spending down and that distribution so it allows for a little bit high a little bit low a little bit left and right as long as it's still within a certain parameter yeah and we're on top of that I can tell you I am doctor compliant <laughs> yeah we work really really hard on that does that affect how teams are set up and how we, we divvy up the work or is it more of a we do what we need to do to get the work done in that matter? And that's really coming from management. Management's looking at the project and the product and, and the products and what needs to happen. So they're assigning you as they see fit to get that done. And then they're also aware of the spin down and what's going on with the spin down and the yeah. So it goes both ways. Yeah. Other questions? You mentioned research being a part of those proposals. Can you give an example of how we're doing that and like any citation? Yeah, like with an e-citation grant, there's a lot of um, concern at NHTSA right now of whether all of these programs and projects that they've implemented are having the impacts that they intended. So the research side of it is an evaluation of the impacts. And there's enough data now in the e-site systems. They've been in place long enough to have a run of data over multiple years to be able to do the research. And so one, they first started putting the evaluation component into it. Now they're starting to put the impact analysis into it. So for like over in Mississippi, it doesn't make a lot of sense yet because in Mississippi, they've only implemented it at the highway patrol level and not the local agency. But Alabama, we've got a lot of data and we've got the diversity of agencies to do it with. And then remember, some of these are pure research. You know, it could be some things that we're looking at total research grants. We submitted one here recently on school safety that includes a lot of technology components 
but the grant itself is about the research to implement a school safety system. And that system involves people, it involves programs, and that's 75% of it. And 75% of the funds actually go to the schools that are involved in the process. And we here at CAPS, should we get that grant, would be responsible for the technology and the research which is considered a very small component, but that's like, I think we proposed four and a half million dollars for that particular project. So it's, there's a huge amount of money, and then it's gonna have that research and that technology component well, in it. What are the kind of things we wanna do, Dr. Myers? You mentioned contracts and grants. A lot of us are aware of contracts and other people. They seem to be more micromanaged by the sponsor, allowing us more scope creep that we've talked about already. At least in my experience, are we wanting to do more of the grants so we can get away from that? I mean, I understand the bread and butter is contracts, but it would be nice to get away from those. No, no, I don't think we're driving away from them. The reason we're driving toward research grants, remember I talked about the capability of UA as a research institution? The drive is that we be more research oriented, that we do more research. So one of the things we don't do a lot of here at CAPS is research and publications. So if we were in an academic unit like Jeff is, you know, there, that's the whole process. He does the grants, but he also publishes, presents off of all of that. He has a research obligation. So that's what we're doing at CAPS now, is trying to include that research obligation as part of our portfolio. So we're driving toward it, not away from the contracts. But it's hard, you know. That said, getting into the research world is very difficult because of that low probability of doing it. They're more, they may be more of a pain. Some of them are great. I mean, you know, if you take the ones that are difficult, we have just as many that are great and easy. Um, but then again, they're easy in the sense of it's a known quantity. That's what I like about them is that we know. Because if you're working on straight research grants, when I was at Mississippi State at the Social Science Research Center, all research grants all the time. And I can't tell you how many units lived and died by that. When your grant money ran out, you were gone. You were done. You were out. And so we don't want to live in that world. <laughs> don't want to live in that world. I think it's more of a sponsor than the grant. <laughs> it is. It is. Yeah, yeah we've we got, got some love and then some, you know, they're prickly. I can do a whole <laughs> session on managing sponsor expectations. And, yeah, from, from a project management perspective, and that's where we sometimes often fail. And we do have a lot of projects too, and so trying to project manage all of those things, that's another thing, you know, all this um, new organizational structure that we've been working on and having Helen in the process is designed to work through those issues. And so we're trying to really streamline that and reduce those issues because we've gotten so big and we have so many projects and so many of you are directly involved. So we're trying to figure out ways to streamline that better. I've got several grants people in here. I got Jeff, I got Rhonda, I got Bill, um, people who write grants and get grants. Is there any comments you guys want to make about the process? Well, when you write, write research grants, you learn, you know, develop thick skin from not the rejection. So the 7 percent is usually now what we're at for rejection rates. So you have to write a lot of them to hit the hits. And, you know, don't don't get too frustrated with the rejection. Yeah, it's interesting too to read the reviews on the rejections and, and look at them because when you read the re the reviews and you look at it, it could be something substantive that's going to help you. You know, when you write it again or write it, you know, for a different entity, um, or it could be something that makes absolutely no sense. And you know, whatever their priorities are and whatever they had just decided who they were going with and who they were not going with, and you can tell that from the reviews. So that's part of the process. But it is you just have to develop that thick skin and get through it. I mean, Jeff has. I mean, this is a prolific grant writer. He's very successful. You are amazing. Uh, I got rejection last night. So. <laughs> <laughs> But that's part of it. It's that percentage that you're talking about. You know, it's like you say, you've got to get enough in the pipeline to deal with the number of rejections that are going to come from that process. And that's what's so frustrating, especially in CAPS, for us trying to do research grants. We can't do as many research proposals as a faculty member can because we've got all these other ones that we're, we're working on and we've got all the management of the other ones. So we do one research proposal at a time usually. And so we stick it out there and it gets killed. And then we're like, are we going to do another one? one of these 
So it's harder for us, and we're trying to figure out ways to streamline it. One is why we're interacting with the faculty. We're collaborating with the faculty because they are entrenched in that process. And so us being involved with them is a big way to get into that world. Is there any outreach for sponsorship? Is like more overhead through sponsorship with agencies just on an ongoing basis, not tied to a product or a parent or anything? Just trying to build those sponsors? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, we have people, as you are well aware, in CAPS who are very good at going out and securing sponsors and, and kind of working on those big retainer deals. And um, I think that's something that's very unique to CAPS is to have that kind of an approach. And that's, again, another stabilizing factor in the grants process. If you've got an agency who's willing to give you a big retainer to do a lot of different things for them, um, it does make you very beholden to that sponsor, but it covers a lot of personnel. It covers a huge timeline. It re organize the way you right. want. They don't have any grant stuff right. locking down. Exactly. Yeah, and so we are. We're constantly, you know, working those. But again, you have to manage those in terms of the organization again. You know, in terms of how many people we have, how the hiring goes, can we maintain that? So that, that's a constant dynamic of working through those. But yeah, that's really important. Rhonda? Um, well, tying to that comment, I mean, it's almost somewhere on uh, contracts are almost like that. I, I would say the DOR and the DECA, they they sort of they fund us and we're here when they need us and so i think that's why sometimes people think it's scope creep but they're they're funding us and maybe they need more right now than they did and maybe it's not as clearly fine because it's just sort of like at least with the deck is support and when they need us we're here um so they might not need us as much sometime and all of a sudden they need us and i, I need you right now and i need you to get me this so it's almost like being on a retainer because, I mean, there are projects that are defined, but then there's, um, we've got one drop, one grant where it's more like that. It's projects clearly defined, we're developing rescue, you know, we're developing e-crash, but then there's others that it's support, it's data analysis, and when they, somebody calls and needs it, we'll provide it. Um, so those are almost like retainers in a sense, and I do think that's sometimes Somebody might say, well, that's scope creep because we want, but it's really not because part of what we write in is to, to provide the support when you need it. And it's, it is defined, but it's sort of generic. <laughs> yeah, by its nature. Yeah. yeah, I think that's really important to know, you know, if you're working on any of those, then that's the sort of thing can happen and that's what's to be expected from something like that. And so there'll be, you know, low work times, high work times based on the demand. And then we have to adapt to that. So, you know, you may be working on different things and this goes back to that percentaging again. It may be that a DECA or a DOR ramps up all of a sudden and so that we got to put resources to that for a certain amount of time and then that gets done and then we take it back off and we're up and back and up and back. So that's really important to know. And the question for you guys is do you know which sponsors you work for? It may be that you're working on so many different things. You may not realize you're on one of these retainer type ones. You may be on one of these really tight grant ones. You may be on a contract one. So that's something important for you guys to know. If you don't know what type of sponsor you're working for, you might want to ask your supervisor. You know, like if you're on an ADECA one, it's maybe the retainer one. It may be a DOR retainer one. Or it may be one of our very short-term contracts. And if we're on one of these short-term contracts, that sometimes conflicts with the retainer ones. Because um, we've got some really short-term contracts where I need the personnel that Rhonda has on her retainer one. And if the retainer one is making a demand at the same time I need somebody on short-term contract and we don't have enough personnel, Daryl, <laughs> who's suffering from that, then we got to figure out how to do that. And do we hire more people to cover that dynamic, but then when it readjusts itself, I don't need all those additional people. So i got to figure out how to do that. If any of you can invent the cloning system, I will be beholden to you for life. I just want to qualify what I said. I, I'm using re that retainer term loosely. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know technically that that's proper to call it that, but I mean, there are, you know, there's a statement of work and things are defined. I'm just saying there's some of those tasks, specifically the support tasks, where you might go along and you don't get any phone calls from there. You don't get a data request or, you know, they don't need anything. And then tomorrow it might be really busy. And so I'm just saying it's, it's almost, 
it's sort of like a retainer, but I don't know technically we should call it that because right. it is outlined. And then I was going to speak to uh, Daryl's comment about should we go for more research and less contracts. The thing about that is the contracts are pretty much 100 <laughs> percent, and the time we put into those, it's it's going to pay off. And that, like you said, on the research grants, two percent percentage, and those things can take a ton of time. And you know, you might get them, you might not. And um, so we're doing more of those, but we've got to we got to rely on those contracts, and because they're um, and again those. I mean, they're they're just as good and because they pay the bills, and we're getting those because we're doing a good job, or they wouldn't be coming back and giving those to us again. And, and they're telling their colleagues in our state and other states about us, and that's how we're getting some of our other contracts. And so, it's it's very valuable. Um, I just want to say that's we can't totally go away from those because those, you know. We're, the time we're putting into writing those uh, is going to pay off. You know. It really does. Yeah, and one of the things we've looked at with the contracts is, especially with the technical contracts, is if they're just too small. If they're too ornery and too small an amount, they're not worth it in terms of all of the things we have to do around those things. Now, some of what we do is not very expensive. So, like, if you take the social science work I do and compare it to the work you do and the differential in cost, my rates are much lower than what your rates are. So, my overall amounts are going to look smaller. Some of our units do things that cost a lot less than some of the bigger technical things. So, those are justified as small contracts. But small technical contracts, it may cost us money to do those small technical contracts. And so we're, you know, starting to look at some of those and trying to figure out how to keep ourselves from falling into those holes. And y'all are all, yeah. yeah. The small technical contracts is the, 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 the sponsors that have, that are giving you small technical contracts very often is because that's the only money they have. And they're going to be the worst ones for scope creep because they recognize that the only way they're going to get whatever it is is by, by, by forcing you to do more than what you really committed to. And so you got to be very selective about the only reason we ever want to take a small contract is if you have a very good certainty it's going to lead to something bigger. Yeah. If you're just going to be nickel and dime by a sponsor, that ends up costing university money and try and stay away from it. Yeah. yeah. Cost caps a lot of money because you wouldn't believe the amount of resources we have to put into working those down. And it's, it's those things, too, where a lot of times it was promised on the front end it was going to lead to something, and then it didn't. And, of course, you know, we hit bad economic times for these agencies, and they're doing more with less, and so they're trying to get us to do more with less. And we also have a reputation for being a nonprofit. And so we don't charge a lot for what other entities will charge a lot of money for, so they think they're getting, you know, a really good deal, but they think they're going to get anything and everything they want. So we've got to be really careful, like Bill said. Okay. Bill, did you want to add any more to the grants process? Bill's one of our big prolific proposal writers. He's, he's like Dave, and they can get in there and they can really churn these things through. And what they do, what makes it really easy, is when you've got an idea for a grant, what we do is we kind of spec it out, you know, in a discussion and in writing, and we give these bullet points to the grant writers, and they sit down and they just put this whole thing together. I mean, they're like English writers. It's just beautiful composition work where they're putting all of this stuff together and they know exactly how they're supposed to say it so that the funding agency gets it. And so it's so nice as the PI when you get that back from them to edit, it's 99% there. And so then we just have to go in and do the tweaks and make the adjustments and do what we want to do to finalize it. And that's what makes us able to fit those timelines that we get those short deadlines. So if you're ever asked to be part of that process to write any of those component pieces and you're told we need it yesterday, that's why because that's going into that process. We need to get it written. We need to get it into a draft form so that we can do the editing and, and get it worked down. Other questions? Comments? Uh, is there any way that we can become, especially for research science, since I'm putting on PhD is there any way that we can become more involved with, especially like the research side of applying for grants? 
Yeah, in fact, you know, there are research faculty involved. The leader labs are research faculty. And so pairing up with them on their research proposals, if it fits with what you're interested in. If you have research ideas that you think would be good within CAPS, you want to propose it to the team to be able to do it within CAPS, we can do that. Um, we have several people within CAPS who are researchers. I'm a researcher, and so you can do it with some of us in terms of that collaboration. So you could bring it to us, or you could work with some of the existing faculty and staff that do those kinds of things. Yeah, so on the, on the academic side, you'd be mainly working with National Science Foundation, and we're actually going to uh, work on, a, uh, in our software engineering group, we'll have weekly meetings. One of the things I'm going to propose is, I, when I work with my own students, I show them the whole process of that, but not, you know, not every student gets to see that, so we're trying to open that up, at least within our lab. So whenever we have that, we can let you all know that. That'd be awesome. And the other difference between research and contracts, the research gives you more flexibility, so you, that, that's kind of like the, the nice thing, the freedom of it, but you know, it's hard to get. But um, where I don't, I, you know, if I want to, if I have a research proposal and I, I win that, I can slightly change my direction and go this way. Mm -hmm. But if you're trying to deliver a contract to a fixed price kind of thing to a, to event, you know, you start deviating and you're in trouble, right? right? So that's another difference. Yeah, and that is, you know, and that's the whole thing about research is having that kind of latitude. You're the scientist, you're, you know, you can take it, you know, as you see things, you can do things and, you know, come up with a totally different thing by the end of the, the project. And so it does give you that latitude and you as a PhD candidate, that's what you're socializing to. That's the sort of thing that you're going to want to be doing. And so that's great that Jeff's got this going where we can actually get you guys integrated into the process. So if you could let us know, that would be... Dr. Carver has done research methods courses before, so looking at the, you know, there's a, a book out called The Craft of Research, you should get and read if you haven't seen that before. So those kinds of things, um, you know, are, are always useful. Right. And we could also do a research methods Dyn.net too, if you don't think, if you think it merits the level of Dyn.net or maybe even a smaller group presentation, we could get um, Jeff or Jeff or me or anybody who does methods to come in and do that. We could also do it with stats you know, because the whole research stats side of it. I do a research stat combo when I do it, and I think Jeff does too. I think he can do it that way. If anybody in here has the right to go out and find interesting things to propose on, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be some small cadre of people doing it. I mean, any, any, anybody in here, if, if you are aware of, of some possible funding opportunity, you can go after it yourself or talk to me or one of the grant writers and we'll help you go after it. Boy, you know, I'm talking about a way to assure a career. Build, you can build your own lab if you're aggressive enough and, and find enough things to work on. Bring money into CAPS, boy. Bring money into university. That's the way to establish a name for yourself and, and have, a, have a career that will go anywhere you want. Exactly. Yeah, because that's what they look at. You know, they're going to look at your research experience. And so while you've got this support network within CAPS to be able to do that, learn the process, get some of the grants, get out there and do it, and you carry that out with you. You can't do it in 40-hour a week, but you can do it. You can do it, yes. Yeah, let me tell you, it's more than your 40-hour a week, <laughs> the proposal writing process. Where do you go for stuff that's not caps bread and butter? And that would be interesting um, because we've kind of diversified more ourselves. Uh, you know, hey, I'm weather. Was caps ever weather? And so, you know, we've diversified into a lot of different areas. And so I think really what it comes down to is how does it fit? with CAPS and there's usually a way to make it fit. The problem is we've made a lot of things fit and that's one of the things that's got us you know, so generalized. So we're trying to be a little bit more careful with that, but if it's grown internally, if it's an organic from what we've already you know, got in here, you as an individual, then it's probably gonna make some sense. Well, the main thing is if you, you need to go after things that we're actually, that's actually feasible, we can carry it out. That's you another know, another with that Medicaid thing came up last summer and we had to turn it down because there's no way we can do a $30 million project. That's too big. Yeah, don't bring me something like that we can't do. <laughs> yeah. You've got something that it's, it's rare that the university would ever turn away money. And that was a big one to turn away. You know, and, and we had to sit there and look at how much money and the fact that no, that would kill us. I mean, we were sitting there looking at, you know, it, it was a, a yes or no situation. If we took it on, it would have destroyed us. There, there was no way that, that we could do it. But you're looking at the science research side where it's like, what if I wanted to research computer security, which is not really our specialty, but that's a computer science.
But see, you might be surprised because there's initiatives going on at the university in that area, and we collaborate with that. So we can we can cross contaminate. The yes, you can cross contaminate all you want. <laughs> yeah. In fact, just hearing that, I'd like to talk to you. Yeah, other universities and other departments within our university. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and that's it too. I mean, we have a lot of collaboration between entities. There's a lot of institutes, there's a lot of centers on campus. You know, Dr. Parrish is now the associate VP for research. And so part of his deal is all the collaboration across the university. And we also have a new president who's interested in a bunch of new initiatives. And so there's a whole bunch of stuff going on, and CAPS has a lot of expertise that applies to every one of them. And so our skills and abilities here within CAPS, we can apply across the board. So one of the things I'm going to be doing is having a lot of you guys present at upcoming lunches and learns to actually expose you to a lot of these other partners out there around the university. And then also, if you could come to the lunches and learns, and I know, you know, We've got this thing about all the CAPS people coming. But if you're interested in the topics, we want you to come. So, you know, that's a good way to grow it. Plus, if I know what you're interested in, what I'd like you to do, given what Cody just said about cybersecurity, if you've got some interest areas, send it the list of your interest areas to me and Alan. Because us knowing that, we're starting to kind of build some teams. I met a cyber person the other day over in criminal justice. And I was like, I took her right to Alan. I said, here's somebody we need to start working with. So now that I know that about you, I'm going to come tapping you. So send me some ideas if you guys have some things you want to work on. It may be something we never get into, but if it is something, then you know we know exactly where to come to get you. Question: uh, When you talk about that Ryan proposal, and they want to know what the impact is, kind of what the end result is in research. I mean, I think the scientific method you can have a hypothesis, but you don't know exactly what the outcome is going to look at, look like. Um, so are they just looking for your hypothesis or just kind of yeah, a hypothesis in some strict terms. There's some entities that are very big about the hypothesis and the hypothesis testing and you know what you would have at the end of that. But then there are those that's more just potential. What is the potential for it? They want to see that you can grapple with the potential of it. And that's where that cost-benefit analysis comes in. They'll ask you on the front end to designate what your cost-benefit analysis would look like. What could this cost? what could be the benefits from it. So typically when I do potential impacts, I say, I know this is what the cost will be, but here's what the benefits are. Because I'm trying to show that the benefits are going to outweigh the cost. Because typically if that research project works, it's going to be replicated somewhere. And it's going to be replicated based on was it cost effective. So that school safety proposal we have out there, that's in that proposal. It says, yes, this is what it will cost, but I've reduced those costs down as much as possible. And here are all the benefits from it. So you're hypothetical and potentiality. So you're right. Other questions? I think y'all like this. I think you were right on to do this. <laughs> all right, well, if there's anything else we can answer about it, you know, we do have a cadre of research grant people. Um, I really appreciate Jeff um, Gray coming today. Um, so we have a lot of faculty that do this kind of work. You know, there's Randy Smith, Brandon Dixon. We have a lot of people that are involved in this. So, you know, tap into any of us for any questions we can answer. Be glad to help you and assist you in any way we can. And I hope this helps you guys understand where you fit into that process. And so if this has opened up more questions about that, don't hesitate to ask. Just even down to the question of which of these grants do you work on and what kind of funding agencies are they? You know, if you want to know that, we can tell you. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.